Forgiveness involves replacing ill will with goodwill. We are hurting people and we live in a hurting world. We have received hurts, probably deep ones, and we've inflicted them too, sometimes without knowing them. That's natural. There is this thing called forgiveness and it's a miracle and you can be a part of that. But you may not want to. That's what I want to talk about today. We're focusing in this part of this series. And I hope that you'll be, uh, for this series, listen to each one of them because they all build on each other. We are on a journey towards forgiveness, learning how to actually do it. and. Uh, the first step is to recall the hurt that you have experienced. But as you do that, it may strike you. I don't want to forgive this person. They don't deserve it. And there are a lot of reasons not to forgive. People are concerned. Well, if we forgive, won't that make us um, inconsiderate towards people who are victims? Won't it make us less concerned about injustice? Don't you have to be angry and passionate to make sure that justice happens? And might not forgiveness soften or blunt that edge? So let's consider it, because that's a very important issue. Simon Wiesenthal was a survivor of concentration camps. He was a Polish-Jewish inmate during World War II in a Nazi concentration camp. And towards the end of the war, a nurse came and took him. He had 89 relatives that were killed by the Nazis. The nurse came and took him to the bedside of a young SS soldier, German, Nazi, who had been involved in atrocities and uh, he said he needed to find a Jewish person who would pronounce forgiveness over him before he died. He was dying of his injuries. He talked about uh, putting a couple of hundred uh, Jewish concentration camp victims in a house and then filling the house with gasoline and he and other soldiers threw grenades in to set the house on fire. And then if anybody tried to escape, jump out of a window, they would shoot them. And he talked about seeing a man with a little child and a woman that would have been that child's mother. Unbearable stuff to listen to. And he got to the end of that and he, and he said to Simon Wiesenthal, uh, I cannot bear to have this on my conscience as I am dying now. I need to know that I can be forgiven. And Simon Wiesenthal writes about this in uh, a piece called The Sunflower, uh, said he stood there for a very long time and then he walked out of the room without saying a word. And afterward, he wrote to a group of thinkers and artists and thought leaders and asked, posed the question, what would you do in that moment? A lot of people wrote back and said, um, you know, you were not in any position to pronounce forgiveness on behalf of other people that these brutalities were done for. So it's kind of a different situation. One novelist, uh, Cynthia Ozick, wrote and cited an ancient rabbinic proverb that if you begin by being merciful to the cruel, you will end up by being indifferent to the innocent. Let him die unshriven, she wrote. Let him go to hell. It's real important as we think about this that we reflect on what forgiveness is and what forgiveness is not so that we understand that it's quite different from condoning or excusing what is wrong. Actually, many things are excusable, but precisely to the extent that they are excusable, they do not have to be forgiven. Um, thank God that what is inexcusable does not have to be unforgivable, but they are two different things. I was talking with somebody recently who was describing a person that was a Christian leader and was involved or was accused of being involved in misconduct and has been in kind of a timeout. And the person was saying, isn't it time that we just kind of forgive? And it is very important here that we distinguished um, forgiveness is quite different than in condoning. Condoning is to say, well, the actions weren't that bad or they were pretty murky. So let's rehabilitate this person. Let's put them back into um, the old position that they used to be in. To forgive is not that. To for you can only forgive an actual person for an actual wrongdoing. To forgive is to say, here's what this person did, and here's why it was wrong. Now, they may or may not be repentant about that. They may or may not think that they 
require forgiveness. Um, but forgiving means looking very honestly, unblinkingly, courageously at the wrong that was being done and naming it. It does not minimize wrong. Another kind of false forgiving, what might be called soft forgiving, that I can be tempted to is forgiveness that really flows out of fear. And it's more kind of an appeasement where this is a strong person or a powerful person. And I just don't want to go through the honest difficulties of naming the wrong that was done that forgiveness might require. So I'll just say that I forgive them as a way of getting out of having to actually deal with somebody. Winston Churchill once said of an appeaser, an appeaser is somebody who feeds a crocodile, hoping the crocodile will eat him last. Um, we might think about it in this way. There is forgiveness. And then you ask, what's the alternative to forgiveness? And the alternative is vengeance. Vengeance is to carry malice, ill will towards the one who has hurt me. Forgiveness involves re replacing ill will with goodwill. Now, justice is a third category. Justice is a desire, passionate desire, that uh, right be done, that honesty and fairness should win out in this situation. And it's possible to forgive someone and be deeply devoted to justice. Um, if I am forgiven by someone when I have stolen them, if I really want to be forgiven, I will want to pay them back. I will want to pay my debt to society. There is no tension between forgiveness and justice. There is a great tension between forgiveness and vengeance, because in vengeance I say, I want to hold on to my right to hurt this person. And so in forgiveness, when we remember, we remember the wrong that was done, but I remember it in a different way. And I encourage you now, because we're actually, we're not just learning about forgiveness. We're, we're becoming forgiving people, you and I. And I know, I know, I know it's really costly. But I encourage you now to think back on someone who has hurt you and remember that hurt, remember that offense. And I want to talk about what Lou Smedes writes in his book on forgiveness as redemptive remembering. And our great teachers in this are the people of Israel. They had suffered a great deal. So now Moses is speaking to them and you and me in our forgiveness instruction manual. This is in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9. Only be careful, he writes, and watch yourselves closely. Literally says, watch your souls, your nefesh closely. So that you do not forget the things your eyes have seen or let them fade from your heart as long as you live. Teach them to your children and to their children after them. Forgetting is not, uh, forgiving is not simply forgetting what happened as though it did not matter. Forgetting can be actually quite a dangerous thing. He goes on to say this in Deuteronomy 5, 12. Um, Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days labor, do your work. Seventh day is the Sabbath. On it you shall not work, neither you, nor son or daughter, nor male or female, nor your ox, not even the, the donkey gets sun, the Sabbath off, nor any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt. Only now this is redemptive remembering. It's not remember how rotten those Egyptians were. Remember how much you hated the Pharaoh. Remember what miserable villainous characters they were. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty outstretched hand. God brought good out of a situation that was terrible. Remember, but remember redemptively. And then this wonderful statement later on in Deuteronomy 23, verse 7, Moses, like in case you didn't get this clearly, do not despise an Egyptian. I bet they didn't like hearing that too much. Do not despise an Egyptian because you resided as foreigners in their country. Well, yeah, foreign slaves. And of course, in the ancient world, slavery was ubiquitous and defeated peoples generally were slaves, quite different than uh, American racial slavery. But what R R Moses writes about here is, do not despise an Egyptian. In other words, do not let unforgiveness fester in your spirit. Don't nurse that toxic cocktail of um, resentment and hostility and hatred and judgmentalism and 
bitterness. Let yourself ruminate over it. No, 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 don't do that. So the question today is, who is your Egyptian? Who is somebody in your life that uh, would be easy for you to despise? And it might be somebody that you despise because of their political views, because they're so wrong. And of course, you're so right. Or somebody on the religious front. And we see every day folks writing on all kinds of issues where if you don't believe what I do, if you don't stand where I stand, there's a kind of contempt that comes through real quickly in the name of God. Very likely there's somebody in your family who hurt you somewhere along the line and um, you're holding on, struggling with that. Could be somebody at work. So your word today, do not despise an Egyptian. Remember, 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 recall the hurt, bring it to mind, but no longer uh, as an opportunity to rehearse your victimhood and superiority. Remember God was there. Remember that other person bears the image of God and is someone for whom Jesus died. And there is a possibility in my life and yours now that is not being the victim of ill will and malice every day. There is the creative possibility of forgiveness with Jesus, which does not undermine, but actually contributes to justice in our world. That's part of the miracle of forgiveness. Forgive us our debts as we forgive. Thanks for joining us. At Become New, we want to grow spiritually one day at a time, but it's tough to do that alone. So we're offering a little more support for anyone who would like to work on putting the content into practice. You can sign up to receive a text at the end of each week in this series, asking if you completed the here's how portion for that week. If you want, you can reply to the text and let us know how it went, or if you need prayer in taking those action steps. To sign up for the end of week reminder, just text the word MORE to 855-888-0444 and we'll put you on the list. As always, to receive the emails or video links by text, you can let us know at becomenew.com slash subscribe. If you're already signed up for the emails but aren't getting them, try checking your spam folder or better yet, you can add us to your contact list. Our email address is connect at becomenew.com. If you need prayer, we're here for you. Text your specific prayer request to 855-888-0444. There's a team of us who meet each weekday to pray specifically over every person who sends a text in. We'll catch you next time.